All right, my name is Micah Unruh. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Kansas, and I'm going to be talking about deep soil carbon today. Um, thank you to uh, Kate for uh, starting this conversation about carbon. I'm excited to continue it in a slightly uh, different direction. Uh, but a little bit uh, about me, as everyone else has been sharing, I grew up um, in a very rural part of Western Kansas. Uh, let's see, there you go. That's uh, a picture that I took last summer from just outside of my, uh, my parents' house. They're uh, back there in that shelter belt of trees. Oh God, what is going on here? There we go. So uh, before European colonization, this, uh, this land was all covered by short grass prairie. And it is, some kind of lag or something. <laughs> and um, people describe it now as a, as a radically degraded landscape, which I suppose is true. But as you can tell, the sky is still very beautiful. There are plenty of things to love about it. Um, but uh, there were six in my graduating class. It was a very small public school. That's the town that I went to school in. Um, and I left for college to New York. Uh, I studied Russian literature at Columbia and then went on to earn a BS in biology. Um, I thought I wanted to go to med school and then I realized that was uh, an awful idea. Um, <laughs> so I went and sat in the prairie for a year and read, read a lot of Rilke and now I am in a global change and biogeochemistry lab. Um, at the University of Kansas where I'm studying controls on deep soil carbon storage. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge my collaborators here in Chile at uh, Universidad Católica. Uh, I'm working in Dr. Aurora Gagiola's uh, lab and I also want to acknowledge uh, Benjamin Morales Lobos who uh, has very generously agreed to help me uh, collect samples four times this year. Um, down in the southern part of Chile. He's in the upper left and that's Aurora in the middle. They are very excited about this snake here. Um, <laughs> I was less excited. Uh, <laughs> so this is the cover from the New York Times Magazine in 2018. And I asked this question, can dirt save the earth? And of course, this is referring to um, the idea of carbon sequestration that uh, many people have talked about today. And this is an idea that's been around for several decades that uh, if we can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, and convert it into some stable form, uh, either as rock or as plant material, and then pump it into the soil, um, we can sort of undo some of the harm that, uh, that all of this burning of fossil fuels has, has done. Um, and in fact, in 2015, three years before this, uh, this edition of the New York Times Magazine was published, uh, the UN started uh, the so-called four, four per mil initiative, uh, whose aspirational goal was to increase soil carbon stocks by 0.4% uh, every year, um, which uh, is a goal that has not been met, um, unfortunately. But uh, since this idea has been around, it has also faced criticism from, um, from many people, uh, including many scientists who think uh, that this serves as uh, an excuse to continue our sort of extractivist uh, relationship with nature. And I'm not going to comment on, um, on that debate, but there is one critique offered by many of the, the critics of this idea that is relevant to my research. And this is the fact that we do not fully understand the controls on, uh, on carbon storage in the soil. And so just to provide some really basic background information, uh, humans produce a lot of carbon dioxide, especially with a burning of fossil fuels. So we burn fossil fuels, that carbon dioxide enters the atmospheric pool, but then vegetation also takes some of this carbon dioxide uh, takes some of the carbon dioxide up and turns it into plant material, into plant biomass. And then as litter from the trees falls onto the, the surface and as roots die and uh, other vegetation dies, um, it enters the soil and forms, oh, well, the word is missing. That's supposed to say soil carbon. Um, that's a pretty key word. 
Uh, so it forms, uh, it forms a pool of soil carbon. But it doesn't stay there forever, of course. It's uh, decomposed. This is dead plant material. And there are lots of hungry microbes in the soil uh, who have metabolisms a lot like we do. So they eat this plant material. They metabolize it uh, with oxygen. And then they respire. They breathe out carbon dioxide, which is then free to diffuse up through the soil profile into the atmosphere. And of course, uh, this cycle continues to repeat. That's why it's called the carbon cycle. Um, so most of this carbon that's entering the soil is cycled through relatively rapidly. Um, so this is from years to decades. But there's a small portion of soil carbon uh, that lasts for much longer, on the order of centuries to millennia. And while the rapid cycling portion of soil carbon is important for regulating atmospheric composition, uh, the slower cycling pool of soil carbon uh, is very important, even though it's only a small portion of uh, fresh material that will ultimately go on to enter this, uh, because it is sort of constantly accreting. This pool of the slow cycling carbon, uh, according to some estimates, makes up to 70% of uh, total soil carbon stocks. So this is uh, where sort of the central question of my dissertation research has started. So why does some soil carbon persist for centuries to millennia, while most is cycled back to the atmosphere in years to decades? Uh, let's see. So this is a particularly important question to ask um, in the context of global change, because a large body of research um, indicates that uh, with increasing temperatures and changing precipitation regimes, um, we're going to see shifts in the balance between soil carbon entering the soil and uh, the decomposition of soil carbon. Uh, and we don't really know which way that's going to go. And because the soil carbon pool, um, especially this, this slow cycling portion, is uh, so large, even a small change in the balance between inputs and losses in the form of CO2 can make a really big difference um, in terms of atmospheric composition and total soil carbon. Uh, and then the question mark emphasizes that we don't know. Uh, so one clue to uh, what some of the controls over this process might be comes from the fact that uh, as we move down in the soil, carbon appears to get older. So this is a soil pit that um, some people from my lab group and I uh, painstakingly dug uh, in the Piedmont in South Carolina. Um, and this is uh, actual data from radiocarbon dating that we, um, we collected. So in the surface, in the surface layers, uh, this was collected in the top 10 centimeters of soil. The carbon is very young. It's modern. It was uh, it entered the soil uh, less than 60 years ago. If we go down to uh, 30 centimeters beneath the surface layer, we see uh, carbon that is 240 years old. And then if we go all the way down to uh, two meters beneath the surface, we see carbon that's 6,400 years old. And I should, uh, I should note that these are not true calendar ages, but this is, uh, this is generally representative of the apparent age of the carbon in the soil. Uh, and as I mentioned, nearly 70% of all soil carbon is in the slow cycling pool and uh, most of this lies beneath 30 centimeters. So from 30 centimeters to two meters in the soil is where a lot of this, um, of this carbon is stored. So how does, uh, how does the carbon get down deep? Most of it's entering up near the surface where the plants are, of course. And uh, one of the answers to this uh, is by transport, hydrologic transport. So as water flows down through soil, it picks up uh, some of this organic carbon on the way down. And as it is infiltrating down a soil profile, uh, some of that carbon is exchanged. It could be deposited at various depths um, and additional carbon is picked up in that water and transported down. But these flows of water are, uh, are mediated by soil structure. Um, and by soil structure, I mean the arrangement of soil solids. And this is a chart that is probably 
familiar and maybe traumatizing to many people who have had uh, soil science class. But uh, this is sort of the basic structural units of soil. These are called uh, PEDs, and this is um, uh, these are the, the typical uh, morphologies of PEDs. So you can see there's a lot of difference. There's this very granular structure. There's this blocky structure over here. We have some that look like columns and then stacked plates over here. And this has a really big influence on how water flows through soils. So you can see in this crude animation um, that this platy structure has a lot different um, flow uh, moving down through it than the, granule, the granular structure uh, in this part of the animation. And you can also see in this video, which I took of soil at, um, at our study site, uh, that this is probably quite a bit different uh, from soil that most of us have experience with, at least me. I dug a lot of holes when I was a kid, and I never dug holes in soil like this. Um, but as you can imagine, this, uh, this sort of fluffy uh, soil with, um, with rocky material mixed into it uh, facilitates uh, sort of rapid flow through it. And you can imagine that the flow through this soil might be a lot faster than the flow through a soil that uh, contains more clay or is, or is denser or has less of this, um, this volcanic material in it. And so this leads us to, uh, to our hypothesis. This is sort of a, a generalized hypothesis, um, but I'm, I'm trying to provide kind of a high level uh, overview here. So, uh, the hypothesis is that the size and spatial distribution of the deep soil carbon pool is regulated by surface soil structure. So our idea is that as water enters the soil profile, the flows are going to be determined by structure in the surface layers. And uh, this will ultimately be what, uh, what controls how much carbon uh, is transported from surface to depth. And this matters because soil structure is changing also. So as we uh, continue to um, convert land from, uh, from forest or prairie to, uh, to agricultural production, of course this causes um, changes in structure because of tillage, because of compaction from heavy machinery, and this changes how water flows through the soil. This also changes um, carbon inputs, of course, because when you plant a field of wheat or corn, uh, you, you take part of that biomass away from the field when you, uh, when you harvest. Um, you're also uh, causing changes in the, the total amount of uh, plant material, the total productivity uh, of that area. So there are lots of places where soil structure is, uh, is different in North America. So why did I have to come to, well, why did I get to come to, uh, to Chile to do this work? And the answer is because where there is variation in soil structure, um, generally it's because you are moving across climatic zones. And as you do that, uh, not only does soil structure change, but so do carbon inputs. So does the geology of the place, which can have a lot of, um, of influence on these processes. And it's really difficult to tell what causes what. So there's a lot of variables that are all being changed at the same time. It gets mixed up. It's hard to figure out what's going on. So we needed to find kind of a special set of soils to ask this question in. And that is where uh, Congillo National Park, about 700 kilometers south of here, comes in. And this park is home to La Jaima, which is uh, one of the most active uh, volcanoes in Chile. Uh, it's beautiful, as you can see. Um, a spectacular park. If anyone has a chance to go there while you're here, I would really, really recommend it. Um, especially in the summer, it's a nice, a nice break from the heat. Uh, but it still erupts regularly. Uh, I think this was from an eruption in 2011 or something. I don't remember um, the most recent eruption. But because of these ongoing eruptions, in a very small geographic area, I think it's about 90 square kilometers, you have soils of multiple ages forming. So how this works is uh, you can see the, the peak of the volcano in the back. And when this erupts, uh, lava, of course, flows, uh, not always in the same direction, but uh, 
occasionally it will cover up um, soil. And of course, when soil is covered by lava, uh, it's not really much good for growing plants. A lot of the organic material in it burns off, uh, and the whole process starts over. The soil starts developing from that, uh, that volcanic material. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what we would describe as a chrono sequence, where there are multiple soils of different ages all forming under the same climatic conditions. And this allows us to, uh, to compare a change in the one variable interest in soil structural features um, across all these places that have different soil structural features. And so there's a wide range of, of ages here and, and how this works, just to kind of demonstrate it a little more clearly. This, uh, this patch of vegetation in the middle, it looks, it's, it's enormous. This is like a, probably a mile away from this patch. So it looks small, but it's, it's huge. Um, so 60,000 years ago, this patch was covered by, uh, by lava and um, it has not been covered in the time since. Uh, and then 40,000 years ago, this patch was covered by lava. It has not been covered in the time since either. Uh, but lava continues to flow in these sort of tongues separating um, these patches from the surrounding areas. And so we have this nice age gradient between the two. And so we are actually looking at uh, four different soil ages. So this is the peak, uh, that sort of nice twin background, uh, the twin, uh, the twin calderas in the, in the previous picture. And we have a 260 year old site. So this is relatively young. Um, a lot of the, uh, the structural features of more mature soils have not yet developed. We have a 770 year old site, a 3,470 year old site, and then that 60,000 year old site that I showed you. And I'm not going to go into uh, the analyses that we're going to run, but um, we're digging pits, multiple pits at each of these sites, collecting soils that we're going to run chemical analyses on. Uh, we're quantifying the, uh, the influence of roots in each of these places. Uh, and we're hoping to see uh, an effect of surface soil structure on, uh, on concentrations of organic carbon throughout these soil profiles. Uh, and then just to acknowledge um, everyone who has helped me along the way, there are a lot of people. Um, and if anyone is interested in having uh, uh, additional conversations about this research or collaborating, I would, I would welcome um, any, any communication from you. <laughs>